one of my all-time favorite stories in the entire Bible comes from the Old Testament. It's the story of Elijah talking to the Lord on a mountain. And the reason I like that story so much, well, there's multiple reasons. First of all, it highlights one of the most fascinating characters in all of God's word. Elijah was not only a mighty prophet who performed some of the most incredible miracles ever recorded, he was also the man that skipped death and went right to heaven in a whirlwind. But there are other reasons why I like this particular story. It highlights Elijah's weaknesses. So we can relate to it. We, we can see where he's coming from. This story also has a little bit of humor in it because of the conversational situation that happens. And this also highlights God's power and his plan and his love, not only for Elijah, but for us as well. This favorite story of mine comes from 1 Kings chapter 19. But before we can get into it, we kind of need a running start so that we have a little bit of background before the story begins. And it really starts back with the king and queen of the time. They were horrible anti-Christian rulers. The king's name was Ahab, and his wife's name was Jezebel. And together they decided that they were going to hunt down all of the Lord's prophets and kill them. And although they didn't succeed with this task, they remained vehemently against anything that had to do with the one true God. That's when the Lord had Elijah invite the false prophets of Baal and the false prophets of Asherah to a showdown on top of Mount Carmel. And so hundreds of prophets came, and those hundreds of prophets built an altar to Baal, and Elijah was the only one there who was a prophet of the Lord, and he built an altar to the true God. And if you remember anything about that story, the Lord rained fire down from heaven and burnt up Elijah's sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the water and the dirt. And after this incredible display of the Lord's power, Elijah had these false prophets put to the sword. But when Jezebel heard what had happened on top of Mount Carmel, she vowed that she would not rest until she laid her hands on Elijah and killed him. And so Elijah ran away. And he traveled for days. And then he went off alone in the desert. And he finally found a tree. And sat down under it. And he said to the Lord. I've had enough of this. I'm ready to die. But instead of granting Elijah's request. The Lord instead sent an angel to him. With bread and water. And then he sent the angel to him again with more bread and water. And after Elijah ate twice, he got up and he traveled south for 40 straight days and nights until he reached what is called the mountain of the Lord, Mount Horeb or Mount Sinai. This is finally where my favorite story picks up. 1 Kings chapter 19, starting at verse 9. There he went into a cave and spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said to him, Go back the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus. 
When you get there, anoint Hazael, king over Aram. Also anoint Jehu, son of Nishmi, king over Israel. And anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from Abel and Mahola, to succeed you as prophet. Jehu will put to death any who escape the sword of Hazael, and Elisha will put to death any who escape the sword of Jehu. Yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal, and all whose mouths have not kissed him. You might remember me saying that in this story, there's a little bit of humor. I don't know if you caught it there, but I think it's kind of funny the way the Lord talks to Elijah. Remember, he's running for his life and he's traveling a long way, hundreds of miles. He is distressed. He is in despair. He's dejected. He doesn't even know if he wants to live any longer. And what was the first thing that the Lord said to him? What are you doing here, Elijah? As if he didn't know. It must have taken Elijah by surprise to hear that question from the Lord. What do you mean, what am I doing here, Lord? You've seen what was happening. You rained out fire on Mount Carmel when I was up there outnumbered. You know that I am public enemy number one of the state. You know that Queen Jezebel is hunting me down. You know how far I've traveled to talk to you. How could you ask me that question? What are you doing here? I've been very zealous for you and no one else has. The Israelites have started to worship other gods. All the other prophets are killed. And now my life is on the line. I'm all alone and I don't want to do this anymore. The Lord doesn't answer his question. The Lord doesn't even address his complaint. Instead, he says to Elijah, why don't you go out and stand on the edge of the cave because I'm about to pass by. But as we just heard, he wasn't in the violent wind that was so strong that it shattered rocks. And he wasn't in the earthquake that shook the mountain. And he wasn't in the fire that torched the hillside. Instead, the Lord came to Elijah in the gentle whisper of his word. Which, by the way, is exactly how he comes to us still today. And what did the Lord say to Elijah in the gentle whisper of his word? The same thing he asked him before. So what are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah responds with the exact same answer. Lord, I've been very zealous for you and no one else has. The Israelites have started to worship other gods. All the other prophets are killed. And now my life is on the line too. I am all alone. And I don't want to do this anymore. And if this isn't humorous enough, what does the Lord say now? Get out of here, Elijah. Go back the way you came. What are you doing here? You have two kings to anoint and a prophet that is going to succeed you. The Lord was sending Elijah back to Damascus, north of Israel. That's about a 450-mile one-way trip that the Lord told Elijah he now has to do alone. He's got to walk. I don't know what Elijah was thinking. But I hope he was comforted when, when the Lord said this to him next. And as far as you being the only one left... Let me, in, let me let you in on a little secret. There are 7,000 people in Israel that I have preserved that are still faithful to me. You are not alone. You not only have 7,000 people on your side, you also have me. So what are you doing here? Stop complaining. Go back where you come from and get the job done. I'm taking care of this. I like this story because you have this great prophet Elijah, but here he's a little insecure. He's feeling sorry for himself. He had done so much work and hadn't seen any results. He put in the time and the effort. He even put his life on the line and nothing seemed to be happening. But he didn't see what the Lord was doing behind the scenes all along. 
He was not aware that the Lord had produced 7,000 times more Christians than Elijah thought existed. 7,000 times more. And so you can understand why the Lord was a little bit harsh with his prophets. What are you doing here? Stop complaining. Go back the way you came and do the work that I've told you to do. I am taking care of this. I can't help but feel a little bit guilty every time I read this story because the Lord can say the same kinds of things to me on any given day. And I bet he could probably say the same kinds of things to you too. Because we feel sorry for ourselves. We get frustrated. We think that we put in the work and we can't see the results. We put in the time and the effort and it seems like a waste of time and effort. As we go to the Lord and we complain to him, We gripe and we whine about how our lives are turning out. And if the Lord would answer us verbally, if we could audibly hear him from heaven, he he would have every right to say, what are you doing here? Stop complaining. Go back to where you came from and do the work that I've given you to do. I'm taking care of this. What right do we have to go to the Lord in the first place and complain? As if we have the authority to go to the Lord and criticize what he is doing, to critique what he is doing and how he is doing it, that's a little presumptuous of of us, isn't it? We don't have his knowledge We don't have his discernment, his skill set, his experience, or his capacity to handle the billions upon billions of little factors that come into play every single second of every single day. And we are going to go to him and complain? We, we, We have the audacity to go to the Lord and question his will and his ways and his plans? Wow, who do we think we are? How do we possibly think that we get to question God's authority? But that's also why I like this story, because we see God's love for us. He could have treated Elijah a lot harsher than he did. He could have said to Elijah, you know what? Fine. If you don't want to be my prophet anymore, then I don't want you to be my prophet anymore either. I don't have to deal with the sour attitude that you're demonstrating right now. See you later. But he doesn't say that to Elijah at all. He does critique him, criticize him just a little bit. But then he lets Elijah in on this insight that the Lord had preserved seven thousand Christians in Israel that Elijah didn't even know about. I certainly don't want to put a number to what the Lord can do in our lives, but I would say he is doing at least 7,000 times more than what we see. He's doing at least 7,000 times more than what we can even imagine because that's what our Lord does. As you read through the stories of the Bible, you see that he's constantly doing things that no one expects. Think of the stories that you know of in Jesus' life. It was filled with unexpected miracles. Before Mary was married to Joseph, she was suddenly pregnant. By the power of the Holy Spirit overshadowing her, the Bible says, so that the baby in her womb would be named Jesus because he would be the son of God. Who ever expected that? Three decades later, as countless Israelites were suffering from deformities and diseases, from debilitating demon possessions to terminal illnesses, who would have ever thought that this carpenter's son from the region of Galilee would show up and cure them on the spot? When mothers and fathers and grandmothers and grandfathers and brothers and sisters lost their loved ones to death, who would have ever guessed that this 30-year-old Israeli young man would command death to stand down? 
And when Jesus himself was on the cross, when he was bleeding at an irreplaceable pace, when he cried out for the final time, when he let out his last breath, when his corpse was buried in a tomb, who would have ever thought that this was his plan the entire time, that his death would count for our life? And then after three days in that cave, while his enemies celebrated and his followers wept, who would have ever thought it possible that Jesus would do the impossible and rise from the dead? Jesus' life is filled with unexpected miracles, something that people never would have guessed or predicted. The Lord still does that now. He still does over 7,000 times what we can possibly ask or imagine. Even if your life doesn't seem to be going too well right now. Even if your life looks like it's leading in the wrong direction. Even if you don't know how anything is going to work out for your benefit. The Lord promises that it does. And he is probably working out seven thousand things for your good. Are you worried about your health right now? I don't know what God's plans are exactly, but he is probably doing at least 7,000 things for your health right now that you don't even know about. Are, are you a little disturbed by the political and the social unrest in our country right now? I'm not sure what the Lord's plans are exactly, but there are probably at least 7,000 different ways that the Lord is steering the directions and the events of this world so that his will is carried out. Are you anxious about the future? Are you getting sick of the present? Are you haunted by your past? Do you want to give up? Do you want to give in? Do you want to get out? I don't know exactly what the Lord's plans are for sure. But he probably has at least 7,000 different things in the works. There are probably at least 7,000 different pieces he is moving together all at once. There are probably over 7,000 different tasks that he is accomplishing every single second. And there are probably at least 7,000 different ways that he is lining up in a row so that they are all fulfilled at just the right time. None of which we will probably ever perceive, understand, comprehend, or know about. So what's the problem? You want to do what Elijah did and lodge a formal complaint to your Lord because your life is so difficult? Well, I'm sure it is difficult. You want to lodge a formal complaint with your Lord because your life is filled with problems? Well, welcome to the club. You want to lodge a formal complaint with your Lord because your life isn't working out the way you thought it would? Or well, whose is? But you're not alone. Not only do you have your brothers and sisters in Christ that you can lean on, you have Christ himself you can lean on, the one who forgives you, the one who adopts you as his own through faith in him as your Savior, the one who promises to protect you and provide for you and give you peace in this life and paradise in the next. So what are you doing here? Stop complaining. Get back to your life and do the work that the Lord has asked you to do. And you can be confident that he's taking care of everything. You can be sure that he's taking care of you. Amen.